What do you call that noise? What do you call that noise? Wow, what a weekend that was. I'm recording this in my hotel room in Swindon after a simply amazing XTC convention. Against all the odds, the organisers, Mike Smith, Daryl Bullock, Julie Matthews and Steve Manning, com commandeered three days of fantastic entertainment. This despite Swindon Borough Council making the bizarre last-minute decision to cancel the convention's booking at Steam, supposedly in respect of the Queen, who was being buried two days later. Somehow, the organisers managed to find alternative venues in the centre of town, first at the Mecca, then at the community centre at Christchurch, before the final day at Jury's Inn. That they pulled it off is extraordinary. That the whole event went so well is a miracle. Give those people a medal. Welcome back to What Do You Call That Noise, the XTC podcast. My name is Mark Fisher, and in this episode, I'll be handing over to Daryl Bullock, who, on the very first night of the 2022 convention, interviewed producer John Leckie. And a fascinating interview it is too, so you're in for a treat there. It was just one of many highlights of the convention, which included a late scheduled gig by EXTC, a fantastic set by Fascine, including covers of That Wave and Another Satellite, and a brilliant one-man rendition of Mama by Dan Barrow. And let's not forget the inventive and surprising gigs by Dance Guru and Fuzzy Warblers. Elsewhere... Daryl interviewed artist Ken White, the designer of the cover of Black Sea, and I enjoyed a lively conversation about life on the road with Terry Chambers, journalist Alan Jones, drum tech Pete Dewhurst, and roadie Steve Warren. Listen out for next month's podcast for that one. It was also lovely to meet so many friends, old and new, over our pints of English sediment ale, and especially lovely for me to win Andy Partridge's Apple Venus era watch in the raffle. What a thrill. As ever, a massive thank you to the supporters on Patreon who keep the XTC podcast going. I really couldn't do it without you. Um, if you'd like to join them, just go to patreon.com forward slash Mark Fisher and decide whether you'd like to be a pink thing, a humble daisy or a knight in shining karma. If it's the latter, I'll read out your name at the end of each episode. And if you haven't bought your copy of What Do You Call That Noise? An XTC Discovery book, just pop along to xdclimelight.com. OK, so here is Daryl Bullock's interview with John Leckie, and I have to give a special thank you to sound engineer Paul Bullimore, who made the audio possible, not just for this recording, but for the whole weekend. He did a fantastic job. Here we go. What do you call that noise? It is my unbelievable honour and pleasure to welcome producer-engineer John Leckie to the stage. <laughs> Now, I'm going to have to look at my script here because I'm never going to remember all this. John Leckie must be the only man in the world, certainly the only man in my record collection, who has worked with all four members of the Beatles and all five members of XTC. <laughs> Wear that one out. Okay? In a career that spans over 50 years. My God, you poor old sod. 52, 52 years. <laughs> His name has appeared on classic albums, including All Things Must Pass. John Lennon Plastic Ono Band and Yoko Ono Plastic Ono Band. Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here, Magazine's Real Life, The Stone Roses, Radiohead's The Benz. He's worked with Bebop Deluxe, and I had to mention them because Mike's a huge fan. <gasps> Simple Minds, Public Image Limited, The Human League. And of course, he was the producer of white music. Go to, take away the lure of salvage, and both Dukes of Stratosphere albums. It is my absolute honor, my absolute pleasure, to welcome him to the stage of the XTC Convention 2022. Thank you, thank you. That was good, wasn't it? That was excellent. That yeah, wasn't it was bad, all right. was it? Yeah. That's better than you getting a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, now, okay. John. Well, was I going to say that I was actually at the XTC convention in 1989? You were, and there, lots there, of us were there. There is photographic evidence as well. I, 
The photograph I put up on the Facebook page recently, John actually sent me again for, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and that's the reason it reminded me to put it up there. And that's the first time I've actually seen myself in that photo, because every other version's been such crappy quality. <laughs> I'm like, there I am, standing at the bar. I'm always at the bar. All right. There's something to do with me in beer. I don't know what it is. But listen, we're going to have a chat, and then we're going to open up the floor for some questions. So please be ready with uh, anything you might want to talk about or might want to ask. But we're going to go right back to the beginning, if that's okay with you. Okay. As a huge Beatles fan, which I am, it would be absolutely remiss of me not to ask you a little bit about what it was like. 1970, you're, what, 19, 20 years old? I was 20, yeah. Yeah. You're working, you get a job at Abbey Road, and suddenly you're working on Apple records, you're working with John Lennon, you're working with Yoko, you're working with George, you went on to work with Paul. What was that like? 20 years old and you're working with four of the biggest names in the world. <laughs> um, well, what was it like? I mean, dare I say, it, at this point, you all, it was a job. <laughs> um, I, I got the job at Abbey Road. Can you hear me in this? Is this all right? Yeah, good. Uh, it's, it's all out there. Too much reverb on the voice. <laughs> um, yeah, I got the job in February, and I think uh, Easter, this is 1970, Easter, kind of Easter bank holiday, because um, there was a, a secretary, a woman, who sort of told you what sessions you would do. Vera, her name was, Vera, Vera Samuel. And she said, uh, John, can you work Easter? Can you work Good Friday over Easter bank holiday um, with, uh, with George Harrison? And I said, yeah, I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, so there I was, a tape op, and I'd only, I'd only been there. Uh, maybe I should explain what a tape op does, because some people don't know what, quite what tape is. So in those days, oh, was still the same, maybe in these days, um, you have the producer, you have what's called the balance engineer, who's the engineer that controls the mixer, controls the balance of all the different instruments. He turns the knobs. No one else touches the mixer except the balance engineer. And in the same way, no one else touches the tape recorder except for the tape op. So the tape op's job was really to take command of the tape, which of course is precious because if you destroy it or if it messes up or breaks, then you just got to record it again. You know, it's all over. There's no sort of undo button if anything happens on the tape. So it's a full on responsible job being a tape op. And also you have to, you have to be good at it because you have to be quick. You know, you have to, if someone says, you know, go to the second verse, and you have to know where the second verse is on the song, on the tape, on the timer, and go there immediately. And similarly, when someone says stop, you have to suss out what's going on in the room and whether the person telling you to stop is actually means stop or carry on. Because very often, the first thing you do, if someone says stop, and you stop the tape, and everyone looks around and goes, what you stop for? <laughs> <laughs> and so you kind of learn being a tape op, but it's quite a responsible job, really. Yeah, I'll bet. Um, and, you know, kind of like if you want to go to the toilet, you have to put your hand up, and the session stops, because no one else will, will run, the, uh, run the tape. And so I'd been in the job for, I don't know, a few months, really, and was dead keen to get on. And uh, George Harrison came in with Phil Spector, Ringo, Klaus Vorman. And I think the first two days we did some demos. Demos being Klaus and Ringo and George playing and Phil Spector. And we recorded loads of tracks. You can get it all now on the box set, of course. And, you know, I didn't realise all this. It was, I, it was only through the, the recent box set that all that memory came back of um, what we actually did, you know. Anyway, the follow after two days, the following day, suddenly the room was full of people. You know, there was, um, how many musicians? I think there was like 12 or 13. For a start, there was two drummers, uh, Ringo and Alan White. And this was before, because my memory was vague and it was only from people feeding me information that what actually went on, because I can't remember, it was bloody 52 years ago. <laughs> but, yeah, so there was two drummers. Some, it started off with Alan White, and so Alan White had played with uh, on Instant Karma and played with, um, you know, various people. Later on, he joined Yes, you know, um, and 
And then suddenly, um, the room was full of Americans, and it was what became Derek and the Dominoes. So we had two drummers. We had Jim Gordon from Derek and the Dominoes. We had Carl Radel from, from Derek and the Dominoes, plus um, Klaus Vorman, and loads of piano players, loads of piano players. We had, um, what's his name, Gary Brooker, Gary Wright, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and Phil Spector. I, I was out, you know, someone said, oh, can you plug in the Wurlitzer electric piano? So I went out and sort of tested it, and Phil Spector goes, can you play piano? Do you want to play on this track? And I'm like, no, no, I can't play, really. And it was you basically... You gun to your head and say, play! Yeah, yeah. Any, any... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, I've got to say, with Phil Spector, actually, I never saw any guns. Yeah, good. I never saw any drinking That's good. either. He was pretty sober. I don't know if he was taking pills, but he was, he was great. He was really in control of the session. You know, he was the, he was the producer. He was the man. Like, nothing happened. Everyone looked at him at the end of the take to see if it was any good. And he gave all the instructions on the talk back. And he would stop a take and go, oh, yeah, bad finger, second guitarist. You've got four guys playing acoustic guitar. And he'd say, oh, second guitarist, you're playing a different rhythm. And they'd go, oh, yeah, I was just going to try something out. No, don't try anything out. Just play what you're meant to play. You know, so he was controlling the orchestration and everything. And of course, it was all made up at the time. Like every, every day we'd do a different song. And they'd kind of jam it, I suppose, until we got a good take. You know, there was arrangements, quite tight arrangements. Um, and of course, what you hear on All Things Must Pass is, as it happened, really. I mean, you know, it was... Um, how many weeks? I think it was about four weeks, maybe five weeks recording, nearly every day, a couple of days off. Uh, so it's all pretty intensive, you know, and you never knew who was going to be in the studio, you know, who was going to turn up. Um, anyway, so that was my summer. And then come September, uh, it was John and Yoko, Plastic Ono Band. And although I'd never met John and Yoko before, they were great. I mean, they were really really friendly, great people, really. George was a little bit, with George Harrison, he was a little, not standoffish, but I never really had a conversation or really sort of had eye contact. <laughs> so it's kind um, of slightly aloof, but John's a little bit more bit. kind of homely and ordinary and yeah, Liverpool, yeah. I guess. Yeah, I suppose so. And Yoko was just there all the time, really. And of course, that, that record was just John, Klaus and Ringo. Um, John sometimes on piano, sometimes on guitar. Um, and it was great. And then one day it was like John came in and said, right, we're going to do Yoko's record today. And so <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard uh, Yoko's version, the side of Plastic Ono Band, but it's, um, it's pretty wild because it's, um, it's them jer jamming, really. It's a yeah. slow blues and a fast blues. And they would play until the tape ran out, you know, like 32 minutes until the tape ran out. Oh, that's enough. And then you'd listen back endlessly. By endlessly, I mean two days, 12 hours a day, play it again, play it again, play it again. Um, and then they'd edit it, and they'd, Yoko would make notes of what's... This is her record, by the way, and make notes of what the best bit. And then I would have to edit all the bits together, which would take another two days. And then we'd mix it with loads of echo delays. You know, if you hear the drums, they've always got a... Dum, 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 with John loved of... reverb, didn't he? There's a lot of kind of echo in... Reverb like and delays, yeah. 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 It was funny, that, because, uh, you know, they did a... What do they call it? A stripped-down or naked version yeah. Yeah. Of, um, of Double Fantasy. Mm. I don't know if anyone's ever heard that, because it's really rubbish. Because... Uh, it's ho horrible. I yeah. have it. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> it's someone, a horrible record. You know, someone it. said, you know, can you mix it again without any effect on John's voice? Because we want to hear his, the, his pure voice. This is what Yoko said. And, of course, John hated that. He wanted effects. He always wanted... Put some more echo in the, hand, in the cans, man. You know, can't, can't hear the echo in the cans. So he wanted to sing with all that on, you know. Um, and is I this, was shot. I'm sorry to interrupt, but is this about the time he started calling you Mr. Licky? <laughs> Licky, that's right. <laughs> when the record came out, if anyone wants to check, when the record came out, I was very lucky to get a credit, actually. It said, um, John Licky, they spent 
spelt my name wrong, L-I-S-C-K-I-E. And, I kind uh, of always thought that was a joke with John, because John liked to play on words, and he was just, you know... No, it was just someone at the record pun. company, someone at the record company. But I was going to get some badges made up, actually, that said, Lennon called Lecky Licky. <laughs> I'm selling them in the foyer if you want. No. We'll do that next time we do this. Yeah. Next time we do this, we'll have some Lennon called Licky Lenny. Lenin. <laughs> Lennon called, called Lecky Licky. We'll have some badges made. We'll sell them online. That's fantastic. <laughs> Can I jump forward a bit? Yeah. Because um, there's so much to cover, and I'm, I'm sorry, we, we do have so much to cover. I'm going to jump forward a little bit to 1975. So the, just a little bit before kind of punk and new wave. And 1975, you're working as an engineer on. Um, what is it? Um, Timeless Flight, which is one of my favourite records ever. Steve Harley's Steve Harley, Flight. Courtney Rebel, yeah. Genuinely one of my favourite records of all time. As, as Red is, is a mean, mean colour. <sighs> what a yeah. great album. And as, as is John and the Plastic Auto Band. But then you go from there to uh, Wish You Were Here, which is one of the biggest selling records of all time. It's a massive, massive seller. I mean, and, 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 you, and then within, what, six months, 12 months, you, you're, you're working in the studio with this little four piece from Swindon who <laughs> nobody's ever heard of, you know, making their first single after being, you know, already turned down by a couple of other, you know, engineers and producers. Really, yeah. What do you think it was that clicked with you in the band that made that early time work? Because they had worked with other people. They, uh, they worked with Steve Levine, for example. That never happened. It didn't, oh, yeah, I didn't, didn't take know. Off. I didn't know. They, 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 they went to CBS and, 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 and worked with him for a little while and nothing happened. And they, they tried lots of demos before, before someone at Virgin or whatever turned around and said, this is the guy to work with. What, what clicked? What was it about you five people that got on? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, just ask them. I mean, we, got, you know, we, we just got on with it, really. Maybe that's what it was, because they had loads of energy and just wanted to do it and record, you know, come on, come on, let's do it. I mean, not in a hurry, but they were just... It was the energy to, to, to be in the studio. And it's funny, because um, when we first went in at this science friction, it was, um, it was in Abbey Road, Abbey Road 3, because I was still working there. And uh, there was no kind of, oh God, this is the Beatles studio, you know, this has got the, this is, you know, this is a special place in Abbey Road. It was none of that at all. It was just like straight in, set up, tune up, let's go, take one kind of thing. And um, I don't know what it was. It was great fun. I mean, it was you, know, you know what they're like. They're, good. they're just really funny. I mean, <laughs> whenever you work with XTC, you always come home with a, either saw cheeks or <laughs> saw belly from laughing so much because, every, you know, everything's a lot of fun with them. That's my memory of them, really, apart from the music. It was always like every day I would have... What can I say? Does anyone ever take mushrooms here? Because when you get, <laughs> when you get that... <laughs> When you get that, when you get that <laughs> smiley sort of, you get that feeling in your cheeks and everything's great. Well, that's that's how I used to go home every night after XTC sessions. Really, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Brilliant. I mean, those sessions happen really fast and really quickly. You didn't spend a massive amount of time on working on like 3D EP, but I know there was some there were some tracks left over. You recorded more than just the, the three or four tracks on the EP. Did we? I things, don't know. Oh, do you not remember? Were there not things no. like um, I'm Bugged in Newtown Animal done at the same sessions? No, that was done at the Manor, surely. Well, fuck a Wikipedia. No, that was done at the Manor, <laughs> surely. <laughs> According to Wikipedia... No, no. Those tracks were recorded at you the sessions and then they carried over to the album. That was going to be my next question. No, no, you can tell by the sound because Manor's, Manor is Helios mixer. It's a different room and sound completely to, to what was going on there. Newtown Animal is great, actually. I used to love that song. Um, but no, that was, all, that was all done at the Manor on the first album. Did you go and see them live at this point? Did I what? Did Sorry. you go and see the band live? I saw, when I first met them, I saw them at the Nashville Rooms. I was invited by uh, Virgin Records. Simon Draper was the owner, phoned me up and said, uh, we just signed this band, they're playing tonight at the Nashville Rooms, get down there and meet them. And they were supporting a band called London, who were full-on punk rock, you know, kind of anger and... And XTC were, <laughs> they were the same, actually. I mean, it was pretty sweaty. <laughs> and in those days, it was what's called gobby, 
So, yes, the audience did spit at the people on stage. Pretty, you know, you ask them, any punk bands in that time w would come off stage covered in the audience's gob, basically. So it was known as a gobby gig. Um, <laughs> unbelievable now, but that's how it was. Um, yeah, and I met them, and we immediately hit it off, and it's like, when do we start, you know? Um, yeah, that's when I that's when I first met them. Really, um, what should I say now? No, that's fine. I, I'm just going to go I'm, do white music. Go we on can from go there. On. So what happened? Uh, pretty much after the 3D EP, um, we, were, we were we they phoned me up and said, "Oh, can you do the album at the Manor?" And the thing was, I was on staff at Abbey Road, which is EMI. And so I went to the, the um, manager of Abbey Road and all excited and say, hey, they want me to do an album now uh, at the Manor Studios. And he said, no, you can't do that. He said, you work for EMI. You can't go off and work for Virgin, uh, Virgin Studios. You know, you're an EMI employee. You've got to work here or you've got to work for an EMI band. And so I said, well, um, what am I going to do, you know? And so I actually did it in my two weeks holiday that year, I took my two weeks holiday and never told anyone and spent ages really worried that when the record came out and it's got my name on it, the manager's going to see my name on the album and fire me, you know. Um, <laughs> that, that's true. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was, it was top secret that I was doing white music at the, at the manor. Um, that story actually continues with um, Go To, because go to at that time, I uh, the, the townhouse studios had just opened, and uh, they wanted to use obviously Virgin XTC being the first band in the townhouse studios to record. Asked me, and again I went to the manager and said, "Hey, guess what? You know they now want me to do an album at the new studios, the town." He said, "You can't do that. You work for EMI. You don't work for Virgin." And so I said. Fuck this, I'm leaving. <laughs> so that's when I left. And so I left Abbey Road. So I left Abbey Road. And, um, and then what happened is I left July the 18th, 1978. And we were due to start August Bank Holiday at the townhouse. And I don't know if Terry or people remember, Steve Warren might remember. Um, we, went into, uh, we went into the townhouse in the morning. The band were there with all the gear, and as I walked in, I realised that nothing was set up. There was no drums or gear or anything set up, and um, everyone was sitting there looking very glum, and the studio wasn't working. The mixer, with the power on the mixer, nothing was working. It's a brand new studio, you know, the big townhouse. And it was like, no, sorry, we can't start for another two weeks, you know, with the studio's not ready, it's not finished. And the band were like, what are we going to do? We were, we were fired up, ready to do it. And um, so I actually, for some reason, I had the phone number, the home number of the manager, Ken Townsend of, uh, of Abbey Road, phoned him up and said, look, Ken, told him the problem. Although I'd left, I was no longer an employee, and said, can we go into Studio 3 for the next two weeks? He said, yeah, if there's no one in there. So we ended up doing Go To in Abbey Road. And it was meant, and of course, I'd left and I wasn't getting paid. That was the mad thing. I was like, fucking hell, I'm working for nothing, you know? <laughs> so um, that was the story I go to, and my career at Abbey Road ended there, really. Um, <laughs> and from then on, it was non-stop, of course, because I was on my own, and I was really keen, and I was just firing away to produce records, you know? I mean, those sessions happened incredibly quickly. I mean, you didn't, as you said, you spent two weeks recording the first album. Was there a feeling from, I, I don't know, somebody at Virgin or that this was going to be over really quickly? We needed to record it soon. We needed to get this stuff out. Yeah. Yeah, there was. There was a real urgency about record. I don't know the gap between when we finished and when it was released. In those days, it was really quick. You know, it was like I mean, it was eight a months few weeks. Before go to, between white music and go to. It's just ridiculously quick, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, of course, the band probably <laughs> played gigs every day, every night, you know, and, um, yeah, it was, it was really quick, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, very much, you know, almost immediately after that, you become one of the most in-demand producers in the new wave. Um, you, you're doing Magazine, Simple Minds, The Associates, The Skids, 
This must have been an incredibly exciting time. It was. <laughs> I can't remember much about it. It's one of those things was that was like, boom. And when I look, when I look at the, um, well, my diary, I haven't got diaries, but when I look at what I did in 1978, 79, I can't remember. I mean, I must have done eight albums a year or something. You know, it was just full on, nonstop, all, all, all different countries. I went to America and... You know, as you say, Simple Minds, they were just the same as, you know, as soon as you finish one record, two weeks later, they'd phone up and say, we want to start next album, you know. Um, yeah, and it was, and it's like, oh, we got, we got this band in Manchester and the Buzzcocks are split up and it's a new band, it's called Magazine. Um, do you want to go in the studio with them and do a single? Yeah, okay, when? Next Tuesday. Okay, let's go in and do a single. Boom, done the single, that sounds great, get in and do the album. And that's how it was, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I, I, I don't think any of us can possibly imagine what that must have been like. It must have been a pretty, you know, full on and intense time. But there's quite a period then between um, Go To and you working with the band again. And I think I'm right. I hope I've done my research correctly this time. I think I'm right in saying that the Duke's sessions come around because you and Andy were both asked to go and work with Mary Margaret O'Hara. That's right, yeah, that's right. You probably all know that story. There's a bit in between, of course. You missed Please. out the lure of salvage. No, oh, tell, us, tell <laughs> us about the lure of salvage. <laughs> so I kind of always think of that as an addendum to go to, but no, no, of course it's not. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, of it's course. drums and wires, so no, talk, it's, talk uh, about it. Yeah, the, um, the lure of salvage was a follow-on from Go Plus. So when we did Go To, Andy, uh, and we'd done it on... Um, some of white music, um, I don't know if anyone knows that white music was going to be called black, black music. music, yeah. <laughs> uh, and the record company saying, you can't call it black music. <laughs> um, and so it's called white music. Um, yeah, and even then we were doing funny little dub mixes for ourselves. We did a version which is pretty rare, Fireball XL5, you probably heard I that. I think it's on the Coat of Many Cupboards box. Is it? Isn't it? The, the Fireball dub. I think Crazy, it's on there. yeah. Yeah, Fireball dub. Mm, <laughs> mm. And then when we got to go, go to, uh, Andy says, come on, let's do some dub versions of mechanic dancing and that kind of thing. And that became Go Plus, which they gave away with Go To. And yeah. then they released it separate. And, the, you know, they were finding that DJs in New York were playing this weird electronic Go Plus record, and a few, uh, I guess a year or so later, um, they phoned up and says, you know, remember that Go Plus? Do you think you could get in and do a whole album of it? And so just me and Andy, I don't think anyone else was there, it was just me and Andy, and every day we would take a tape, a 24, we had all the tapes from the three albums, Drums and Wires, um, Go To and, and White Music, we had all the tapes there, and every day we'd kind of, pick a tape and put it on and say, well, what can we do with this, you know? Should we slow it down? We, I don't think we played anything backwards, but we'd slow it down, speed it up, and we'd do things like take all the drums out, but just leave the tom-toms. So you'd have silence, and then every time Terry hit the tom-tom, it would go dum 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 and then silence, and dum 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 and that would become the basis of a track. And, you know, Andy would sort of say, okay, let's do the opposite. Make the bass drum sound like a snare drum, make the bass drum sound like a cymbal and, you know, make the cymbal sound like a bass drum. And you're kind of, what, what are we doing here? So it's full on knob twiddling, really. Um, some of it, it's not dub. I mean, it's not like a Jamaican Rastafari sure, sure. dub. It was a Swindon version of dub. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we were just, made, we were just having Swab. fun, you know, and somehow... And, Virgin loved it and says, oh, we're going to release it, you know. <laughs> and there it is, and it's XTC Explode. It was great, and it came out on CD as XTC Explode, because that's exactly what it was, you know. <laughs> so we're going to go back, if you don't mind, to Mary Margaret O'Hara. Mary Margaret O'Hara story. And how, and, and the, the gestation, if you like, of the Dukes. Yeah, well, I... St I'd, I'd stay in contact with Andy, um, you know, through the years, every time I'd I used to work at Rockfield, and every time I drove backwards and forwards, I'd drop off and see Andy for a cup of tea and, you know, do the, you know, just for a chat and stuff. Um, and then one day he phoned me up and said, do you know this girl, Mary Margaret O'Hara? And I'm like, no, I don't know. He says, well, I've just asked, been asked to produce her at, the, at Rockfield, and will you come and help us out and engineer it? And 
I said, yeah, 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 I'll do it. And I never heard her. I never heard her music or anything. And I thought, well, I'm not really producing it. Andy knows what he's doing. And um, what happened was that... Um, what <laughs> happened... <laughs> I never met her, you see, but after, and I was busy, and so Andy went up to Rockfield to rehearse with the band, with Mary Mar Yeah, she had an American band. Um, I don't know if she'd been playing gigs with them, but anyway, Andy rehearsed with them, didn't like the band, felt them really a bit shabby, and walked in with his Lin drum, his drum machine, and said, okay, we're gonna rehearse to the drum machine, and they immediately didn't like that. But there was another thing about it, which is probably why you're asking me the question. Kind um, of, at the yeah. time, so this was like 1982. No, it was later. It was about 84, wasn't it? 84, 85. And um, at that time, I was I was um, I was a member of the Rajneesh uh, cult. I don't know if you know Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, who's now called Osho. You can you can check out the documentary on Netflix anytime. What's it called? It's called the uh, yeah. You were there. <laughs> yeah, and so I was a, what can you say, disciple. I, I joined the commune, actually. I, I sold my house and my wife and family. We all joined the commune in England. We didn't go. We did, went to America a few times. So I was a full-on devotee. Um, used to wear red clothes and this kind of thing. You had to wear red. I mean, not red robes. You wear red jeans and a red T-shirt. And it was a great thing. I mean, it was at the time, it was, I was really into it. You know, so. Anyway, go back to Mary Margaret O'Hara. And um, uh, 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 Andy's there rehearsing with the band. And, um, and she's a devout Catholic, apparently. She, has spent, she never came out of her room. She hardly really, I don't know, because this is what Andy told me, she never spoke, she never came to dinner, and, you know, she would go to mass every day or something. And Andy, the, the, the manager called Andy up and sort of said, Andy, I don't think this is working. And Andy's like, not working, we haven't done anything yet. You know, we haven't even rehearsed or, you know, she hasn't sung, she hasn't, she hasn't even been in the room with me, you know. And, um, and the manager says to Andy, tell me, Andy, um, what religion are you? And Andy was like, you know what Andy's <laughs> like on religion. And he, go, he kind of goes, well, I don't know, Church of England, you know, or something. Oh, uh, yeah, I thought so. And tell me, what religion is John? And Andy said, oh, you're really like John. He's really religious, you know. He's, he follows this Indian disciple called Bhagwan. And then they looked at each other, oh, I've heard about him, like free love, free sex and all this stuff, which Yikes. is the name they gave, you know, they gave, what, that was the reputation we had, you know. Who doesn't um, love a bit of free sex? Yeah. And so that was it. And then Andy phoned me up and I, he said, you know, you're coming to Rockfield tomorrow. And I said, yeah. He said, don't bother. He says, we've been fired. You know, that's it. You know, you've been fired and uh, so don't show up, you know. And I said, well, this is no good. We were booked for, I think we were booked for like three months work. We had the mixing booked and the whole thing and like six weeks at Rockfield and all this stuff. And I'd cancelled things. I said, well, this is no good. You've got to talk to Virgin. I want some compensation for cancellation. You know, this is like three months job that you suddenly get cancelled the day before. And he says, all right, I'll have a word. And then he phoned me up and said, we've just been given a budget. Uh, to do, do you fancy doing a psychedelic record? And my, I said, you bet, yeah, let's do that. But and that budget was five grand? <laughs> five thousand pounds, yeah, we got five thousand pounds. And do you know any cheap studios to do it? And we ended up in this little studio in Hereford, where I'd worked before. Um, I'd done a few records, I did The Fall there, actually. I did The Fall and Jean Loves Jezebel and various other singles at this little place called The Chapel, which was really good, and had a house. And it was like 200 pounds a day, including the accommodation. And they'd fill the fridge up with every night and the studio and everything. So it was great for us. And um, I think we did the whole record in two weeks, mixing and everything. And I think I got, I don't know, 1,000 quid or 500 quid, I think I got for doing it. Um, and uh, we gave Virgin a 1,000 pound change. They couldn't believe it. We'd done this record. And, you know, and they, we gave them a thousand pound back. So it's finished, done, mixed, you know. And they heard it and just fell about laughing. They thought it was the greatest record ever, you know, 25 o'clock. And, um, and then, of course, it went, it, it got released and it was, 
the word came back from America that it was selling more than the Big Express and all the records that went before. So um, a few months later, they said that Andy phoned up and said, oh, guess what, you're never going to believe this. We, they want us to go in and do it again, do more, another album, you know. So that was what became uh, Sonic Sunspots, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, it was great, time, great, great fun. I mean, uh, it was great doing the Jukes because... What can you say? There was no pressure, you know. It was just a lot, a lot of fun, and you could. It's almost like the band could sort of act, uh, act like they were other people, you know. I mean, Andy's great impersonator, so he mm, would, mm. you know, he'd impersonate different accents. He'd do, turn on his American accent and turn on, you know, all his crazy stuff. And um, have you he heard his Alan Bennett? Have you heard his Alan Bennett? No. Andy's Alan Bennett is amazing. It's, he's just the best <laughs> Alan Bennett impersonation I've ever heard. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But no, it was, a, it was great for all of them because, you know, Gregsy could kind of show off all his guitar tones and kind of, oh, we want it to sound like the electric prunes or we, you know, we want it to sound like it's some, I don't know, some reference of some 60s thing. And then we, then we got on to the Beach Boys, Pale and Precious, which is a fantastic track, you know. Um, it was all a lot of fun doing that. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to backtrack slightly because you skipped over half of my questions. Um, Sorry, but, do I talk but, too much? No, no, it's cool. <laughs> no, not at all. No, I'm sure people have much rather listen to you than listen to me. So no, in the slightest. There you go. See, <laughs> <laughs> not at all. And, I'm, and I know there were there were voices over in in this direction who would have loved to listen to more of your stories about John and George, but it, we just don't have the time. I'm going to have. I'm going to. Oh, a quote, a quote from Mr. Partridge. And he said that um, English psychedelia is John Lecky in a striped blazer with a big gladiola in his hand on the lawn and someone's let off a purple smoke canister, which I think kind of, kind of explains or, or describes 25 o'clock kind of beautifully. It's it there, is, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny because... Um... At the time, I was doing The Fall, you know, Mark E. Smith was nothing to do with XTC, but I was isn't, doing... Isn't that The Fall La? Fall La. Fall La, yeah. And la. I was doing The Fall, and Mark was, you know, Mark, Mark was always into psychedelia, and I said, and, and Brits, the, his wife, the girl at the time, she was, um, oh, John, that, that, that Dukes of Stratosphere record is so great, it's so psychedelic, and... and um, Mark's sort of sitting there going, depends what you call psychedelic, doesn't it? You know, it's not psychedelic to me. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, there's that, that's what, probably what the question is, the difference between English psychedelia and American psychedelia, you could say. You know, American is a lot more hard edge, a bit more punk rock, garage, screaming, a bit more distorted, I think, you know. Whereas the English one is Alice in Wonderland, it's Lewis Carroll and everything is beautiful and... You know, it's that kind of thing. And, and you could put, every, you know, what we all aspired to, of course, was Strawberry Fields Forever. That's what we wanted. We wanted music that came from another planet and no one could tell what the instruments were or what the lyrics meant and, you know, turn off your mind and relax, float downstream and all that. That was British psychedelia. We've talked, I mean, absolutely. We've talked a lot about... Andy, and, and you mentioned Dave with uh, 25 o'clock. We haven't really mentioned Colin yet. And one of the really interesting stories for me about what happened with 25 o'clock and Colin's song, What in the World, if you recall this... The most psychedelic song is, ever is recorded. Verd yeah, it's a fantastic, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful song. Is um, what happened with Verdon Allen's Hammond keyboard. Do you remember <laughs> the story? I Would do, like I do, Would you to tell yeah. people? OK, so we're, we're at this little studio in Hereford, and uh, Verdon Allen was in Mott the Hoople, and he was a real Hereford lad and lived on the farm still with his dad and stuff. But he did have a Hammond organ, and we wanted to get one, and we didn't really want to get it up from London, like rent it or anything. And someone said, oh, I'll give Vernon a call and see if he... And he said, oh, yeah, you can use my Hammond, you know. Anyway, he turned up one day with the Hammond on the back of a tractor... And uh, <laughs> set it up and everything, and then was hanging around because he obviously assumed that we wanted him to play. 
And I had to explain to him, I said, no, well, actually, we just, we don't want you to play because we have a keyboard player here, uh, Dave Gregory or something, and um, we just want to borrow it for a few, you know, we'll hire it, whatever it costs, whatever you want to charge us, you know, um, we just want it for a few days. He said, oh, okay then, and he went off home. And this Hammond, you've got to remember, it was immaculate. You know, there wasn't a scratch or a mark on it, had the, hat, the Leslie and everything. And the first thing I did was take the back off of the Hammond because there's a little, there's a little amplifier there and if you, it's got a phono socket and if you plug into the phono socket, you can put a microphone in and your voice comes out of the Leslie. You know, you can plug a guitar in, you can, you know, sing through it and the Leslie's going round and it's great. So I take the top off and notice that none of the screws have got burrs on, so that he's never taken the back off this thing. Anyway, I take the back off it, plug it in, we do some vocals, and Dave does some guitar through the Leslie, and we go off to bed. Next day, about eight o'clock in the morning, v Vernon comes round to pick up his hammer, or just comes round and sees it with all the back, all in bits, you know, <laughs> the back's off and there's wires coming out of it. Uh, oh, you can't have that, you know, and he took it away. And we, we got up, we, they didn't tell us, you know, and we got up in the, you know, 11 o'clock and went in the studio and the Hammond's gone. And we're thinking, oh, someone's stolen the Hammond. And of course, he come and picked it up because he didn't like us doing that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> was the mold for the ministry really improvised in the studio? Yeah, it was, yeah. You know, mold from the ministry was totally made up by Andy and he's been a good few hours bashing out the chords on the piano and doing the words in the way I did. Uh, if the suitor started, you know, he'd be writing the song and everyone's like, come on, Andy, you know, come on, let's, let's hear it. And they, they had gone off somewhere and gone off to the town and came back and what's all this then, you know? And, uh, and literally within a couple of hours, we had it. We had it all down, you know? And the thing was, you got to remember in those days, in those days, um, you didn't record with a computer and you didn't have a click track. You didn't play along to a beat and a tempo. You just got all the musicians together in the room and they played it. And, you know, if it was too fast or too slow or if there was a mistake, you did it again. Um, in fact, every XTC track I've ever done is with no click and no... no um, no, no computer, no regimented stuff. It was always capturing the live take, you know. And by live, I don't mean a concert live. I mean, as for me, the magic happens with music with as many people in the room at the time playing together. And although it might be a shambles, that's what the producer does. The producer sorts out the shambles. But you still got to have people in the room. I probably got that from way back Phil Spector and George Harrison and stuff where you just get a lot of people in the room, and if someone keeps messing up, you turn them off. <laughs> it's as simple as that. <laughs> yeah. But the energy in the room with more people is so much better than someone sitting there with the headphones on, listening to a drum machine and, you know, trying to keep in time and then spending three hours on the computer adjusting it all and stuff. Forget that. You never, Even though you get there in the end, it, it never translates. You know, the listener doesn't get it you know it's like what you look at like it's like taking a photograph really you know you can take a photograph and bodge it up in in um photoshop in photoshop yeah. or you just take that snap and i'm sure you've all got photo albums and you look at your best photos and they're usually a snap they're a one-off untouched thing mm. and it's the same with recording i think do you think recording um uh, 25 o'clock in, in only a couple of weeks and with such a limited budget actually helped on experience, made it more authentic. Yeah, 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 it did. But that wasn't the intention. I mean, that's, you know, people say with Dukes of Stratosphere, we used old equipment. We intentionally used vintage gear and vintage microphones. Well, we didn't really. I mean, that's what our, our attitude, our vision was to keep it sounding 60s. But we didn't use exclusively valve microphones or or that kind of thing um but no we, we were going for the, the 60s thing you yeah know? sure and it was done like i mean because we didn't have much time i mean we couldn't record one instrument at a time because we were all feeding off each other you know i mean a lot of that jukes thing 
what you hear is the first time they played it. You know, like, uh, and Andy would say to Colin, have you got the bass line, Colin? He'd go, oh, I think so, let's do it, right? Take four, and that was it. You know, it wasn't kind of considered. But they're just great musicians. You know, all great musicians are gonna sound great because they're great. <laughs> so it's, I mean, uh, 25 o'clock was a massive success for you know, for XTC at the time, certainly, compared to, as you mentioned earlier on, compared to how the previous albums had sold. Was it a, uh, was it a surprise for you, or, or, or a, a slight, maybe, that you didn't get off of the next XTC album? Did, did, was that an issue? Yeah, it was, really, yeah. 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 But you know what? I, I, I'm OK. I, I can forgive them, because what the... The, uh, what Virgin said to him is, because 25 O'Clock was a big success in America on Geffen, you got to remember that Geffen Records in America were releasing it, and they said they would only do another album if they used an American producer. Uh, and there was a list of them, and top of the list was Todd Rundgren. And they said, yes, we'll do it with him. Um, so I don't blame them, really. I mean, you know... If they did it with me, we'd be in Hereford with Verdun Allen's <laughs> <laughs> Hammond organ or something, you know, <laughs> taking mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> but it was only one more year. It was a year af after Skylar King and the Dukes are back yeah. with, with another album. And this time you're in Cornwall yeah. with double the budget, is it? We, what, 10, maybe 11,000 pounds yeah, this time? Yeah. 11,000 pounds <laughs> to record a 10 track and mix. fucking masterpiece. <laughs> you know, I mean, what, how, uh, uh, I, I, I cannot get my head around this concept of how, how you record such a wonderful record with so little money. I mean, well, we're, my God. We're, it's, I don't know, what was it? Because we're all on it. We're all like, accepted, we all trusted each other and everyone was focused on the song, really. Today we're going to do Kaleidoscope. OK, how's it go? You know, this kind of thing. I'd throw in ideas. You know, there'd be backing vocals. Colin would come up with things and, you know, it was... Um, and it's funny because it's only years later that I realised there were demos, because I never heard any demos when they did them. It was like, OK, next song, it goes like this. You know, we never rehearsed, and I never heard demos for 25... It's funny now, when I hear these demos, it's like, you never told me you, you did demos, you know? Because <laughs> there were a couple of tracks on uh, Sonic Sunspot that were planned for earlier albums that hadn't made it. I think That's Shiny right. Cage is one, and... Yeah. Um, I think a couple of the Collins songs were originally planned for Big Express and they just weren't right at that time. Yeah. Did that make the process maybe less spontaneous than, than uh, doing 25 o'clock? Because they already had stuff together? Mm. I, maybe, yeah. I don't know if it was that. It was probably the, the fact that we had more... We had to do a whole album. I mean, when we did 25 o'clock, we did six tracks and we could have done four, you know? I mean, yeah. it was basically go and do something. If you can, you know, if you can do a single, that'd be great. If you can do four tracks, that'd be great. So it and was always going to be an EP at most. Yeah. It was never going to be, there was never going to be an album there. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no one knew what it was. Who was ever going to release it? There mm. everyone. It was, it was compensation for Mary Margaret O'Hara, really. You know, it wasn't a planned record, you know. <laughs> is, it, is it true? You might not recall this, I don't know, but... Again, it's something I've read. Is it true that the band wanted Derek Geiler on the album to do the, the yeah. inter-track talk? Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, they did want to, him to do it. Um, and all that talk, you know, it was like... When we, when we started mixing, uh, really 25 o'clock, because that's how we sort of developed the, te the spontaneous technique, you could say. When we started mixing, the first thing... The first thing we did was make up a, uh, a reel of tape of sound effects. So we'd have like horses, sounds, seagulls, uh, waves, uh, Winston Churchill talking, snippets. You know, we got it from I'm the Walrus, snippets of radio and, and news reports and things. And I'd make up this tape with all the effects on and being a great tape op that I am, I'd write everything down and put leaders in between each sound effect. And so I'd look at the tape and know exactly where Winston Churchill was track seven and that kind of thing. Anyway, when we came to mix, 
we'd have actually two of these sound effect tapes just running all the time. And, we'd do, and it's a manual mix. I mean, there's no computer involved. So we sit there and you start, the, you know, and you, when you do a mix and you move the faders up and down as it should be. And if it got a bit boring or there was a mistake, the great thing was if there was a mistake, Andy would say, just put the sound effects over. Put the horse on, you know, put Winston Churchill on or something. And so, you know, you'll, you'll be doing the mix and you'll and it get a bit, you know, you'll think, oh, and you'll just get the sound effects, turn up the fader, and you didn't know what was on it. You know, it could be anything. And you turn the fader up and it was like, whoa, there's horses and galloping <laughs> across and there's all that kind of stuff. And that's what, and we'd fall about laughing because it was great. And it was psychedelic, you know, you had all stuff flying around, you know. Um, and so we purposely did that for a lot of fun, for our own fun, really. It wasn't thought out. We're not going to say, OK, on the second verse, we're going to have seagulls. And this, this, it wasn't arranged. It was totally spontaneous. And that's what makes it a lot of fun. Even now, I listen to it. I'm sure Andy and the rest of them listen to it. And they kind of go, wow, what was that? I don't remember that happening. You know? <laughs> I mean, that, it's, it's just a, such a wonderful album. Both those albums are wonderful. All five of those albums that you were at home with the band are wonderful. But uh, the Dukes seems to have kind of clicked with an awful lot of other artists. And there are, there are bands that came to you afterwards because they had heard the Dukes albums and they wanted to work with you because mm. of that. And I think, I might be wrong, but I think that's one of the reasons you ended up working with the Stone Roses. Yeah, they liked, they liked that. I don't know why. Well, actually, the Stone Roses, I don't know if you know, anyone knows the Stone Roses. There's a track called Made of Stone, which was a single, and it's, the B, it's on side two of the Stone Roses album. And it's 25 o'clock. You know, the tune, the, me the verse melody. Da, 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 da. <laughs> that's 25 o'clock, and it's the same as Made of Stone. So whether that's... Uh, you know, intentional, I don't know. <laughs> but no, I, I, I just, I, I mean, the Dukes are one of the records I still listen to, you know. <laughs> it's, it's the one record I have. I have a massive Dukes poster in my front room. Uh, okay. I have a, a 25 o'clock poster autographed by the, the members oh, yeah. of the band at, in their kind of, you know, student... With, with my student picture name. at the bottom, well, in the striped laser. Well, that's the back cover, isn't it? I've it's got the, the front cover, cover. Yeah. I've got the front cover up, sadly. <laughs> but it's, it is, it's, I mean, I mean for me, I, I think the, the two Dukes albums are... They're massive fun to listen to. There's so much, it's so clear. I always, I always thought they should be file under comedy or humour, you know, when you go through the record lyrics and it's like comedy records. Oh, there's the Dukes of Stratosphere. <laughs> but isn't a lot of British psychedelia comedy? There's a load mm. of, there's a load of humour in that kind of music that people don't get or they get so serious about yeah. that they completely miss. And the Bonzo, or... Sponsor Dog Doodah Band, you know. And I, I think... <laughs> I tell people in the, in, in the 60s, we used to listen to Jimi Hendrix, The Who, um, The Stones, and the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. It's like, how can you listen to Jimi Hendrix and the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band? Well, we did. <laughs> yeah, because Jimi Hendrix never laughed, did he? He no. never laughed, you know. <laughs> ridiculous. But there's, there's real humour in those records, and every single person I've ever spoken to that knew or has worked with XTC or has interviewed them or spent any time with them, and we're all going to spend some time with Terry later, they all speak about how funny that band is, how fun, how much fun it was spending time in a room with those people. And I, 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 can't, I can't ask you to pull on a, you know, a particular memory or, or, or personal story, but it must have been just a riot working with them. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. As I say, like, aching cheeks and aching belly from laughing, really. <laughs> Well, listen, I think we're getting towards the point where we should probably open up the floor to a few questions. I can't see very well, and you're going to have to shout. Well, I've got a radio mic. Oh, so uh, brilliant. Steve, well done, so, man. Uh, well done. If um, anybody would like to ask a question, please put your hand up and I'll come over to you. OK, we'll go down the front here. John seems pretty happy to talk about anything. <laughs> so, please ask away. John, do you have to like a band to produce them, or can you produce somebody that you don't really like? No. <laughs> no to which? No, no, you don't have to like them or...? Uh, I, I wouldn't produce them unless I liked them or unless I felt I could contribute something or I felt I could, I could give them guidance. 
I mean, you know, if I don't like the music and they're in the studio and they do a take, when the music stops and it all goes quiet, they're going to look at me and say, what do you think? And if I don't like them, I'm going to go, I don't like it. <laughs> so there's no point in carrying on, no, even starting it, really. Okay. <laughs> Cheers, Nigel. Hands up, please. Okay, we don't have the front of the We'll come to the roll of you. It's probably very unprofessional, actually, from my but side. But it's honest, but it's honest. And honesty is really important, you know? Um, so you were talking about, um, yeah, the, the really manic schedules of the bands that you worked with in the late 70s, and there's less of an expectation for bands these days to have schedules that manic. It's more OK for bands to take a few years to make a record. What do you feel about that? I guess about is it? Is there some? Is there something about like the manicness in which bands were were expected to work in the seventies that like was a great thing, or or do you have more more complex feelings about that? Well, I, I've done it myself, and one of the worst experiences is spending a year doing an album. I mean, I spent three years doing the second Stone Roses album, and it was fucking hell. You know, um, no, I, I'm not saying you know, do it in two weeks kind of thing. I mean, most records, when I look at my diaries, most records I do are like 50 days, 54 days. It depends now because it's, the whole technique has gone. It's, I'm talking 54 days, 12 hour days in the studio. I'm not talking about sitting in your bedroom with the headphones on doing the vocals and that kind of thing. It's, it's all changed now with the technology, like, you know, people sending files to each other rather than assembling in a room and, you know, almost rather than having a producer. You know, a lot of bands think, oh, I can produce myself. That must be easy. Anyone can do that, you know, but you try it, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, that's, that's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. During um, your go-to experience, could you see Barry Andrews leaving at that time? Uh, what was could I see the dynamics, Bar Barry Andrews? What was the dynamics at the time of the go-to album? Well, again, it was a lot of fun, even go-to. I mean, uh, Barry was, what could I say, outspoken. I mean, it wasn't aggressively disagreeing, disagreeable, <laughs> uh, disagreeing. Um, it, I, I, I was, was I surprised when he left? No, I wasn't surprised when he left, um, I suppose. Uh, it wasn't bad vibes. I mean, Barry, you know, the rest of the band let Barry do two songs on the record. I think we did three. I'm sure there's a third. I think there were five recorded. There was five yeah. recorded. There you go. So Sargasso Bar and, and another bit Sargasso of Bar. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah, yeah, us being us, and has that yeah. been released? It's on. I think now it's on uh, cut of many cupboards, but it's been on oh, bootleg yeah. for years and years. But it's there around. It's, I know I we did a lot, a lot of more, more than what went on the record, and you know, I, I, I had to actually phone Barry out and tell him that we were dropping so. one of his songs from the album. You know, you only got two on what's super tough and my weapon, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, Things uh, fall to bits is the one I couldn't remember. That's the fifth track. Bits and bits and bits. Things fall to bits. Bits and bits and bits. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but Barry was great, of course. I mean, totally unique keyboard player. I mean, you know, <laughs> and that Lawrence piano. I'd still never seen another one. That little piano he used to have, that is called made by Lawrence, and it was like a mini upright grand, an electric, and it was all beaten up. I mean, all the keys worked because he could play it. And it just had a pickup, and he used to put this treble booster. It was a Dan Armstrong or Dan Electro treble Electric. booster. Boom, and he'd plug that in and then plug the jack in, and he'd hit the key, the, 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 the keyboard, and, it, and it, would, it would like hurt your ears because it was so bright. But you only, it was great because it balanced with the guitar, you know? So you've got Andy's guitar, which is really chunk of bright and sharp and the, the piano had to compete with it not com as far as Barry is concerned he had to go one more you know and overtake but um, no it was great and the Krumar organ and all that, that and dog breath you remember that when they did, they did uh, Old Grey Whistle Test and he wrote dog breath on the back of his um, and I'm like well, what's that you know and I think when he went to the BBC he had the Krumar organ which he used to turn you know swivel up and down and it didn't have a cover on it it was just open 
you know, didn't it? And the BBC insisted that he had it as, like, you know, health and safety. You can't have an open electronic thing there. And they put a Perspex cover on top of his organ because they were frightened of it exploding. <laughs> yeah, it was good. Hello. 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 <laughs> How do you imagine that Skylarking would have sounded had you produced it? If you'd produced it instead of Todd Rundgren, how do you think that? It probably would, would have sounded imagine? like 25 o'clock, I suppose. <laughs> Can that come about? Please? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping over here. All right. Um, I heard that when Andy Partridge upgraded to CD, that he gave you his entire record collection <laughs> and fitted you in a car with it. Um, do, you remember any, do you remember that story and do you remember anything that he of gave over I to do. you? Of course I do. Yeah, of course I do. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny because he did, we never spoke about it. And one day, as I say, like if I worked at Rockford, I'd pop in for a cup of tea. And um, CDs had come out, and Andy had all his albums stacked up, and he was going to put them in the shed or something. And um, Marianne, Marianne, his, wi his wife, um, she said, oh, can't you get rid of these albums? Do you want them, John? And I said, well, yeah. And Andy says... You can't, and I started going through them like one at a time. And he says, No, no, you can't go through them. He said, You you gotta take all of them or none. You can't just take a few. And, and I learned, you know, no, I don't know how many there were, probably about five hundred records. And I said, All right, I'll have them all. <laughs> and so we put an either MG and MGB and uh, we filled the whole car with these <laughs> albums. And um, I've still got a few, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I, when, because there was a lot of stuff there. I mean, there was Residence, and um, I remember the Residence, which I still got. Uh, just lots of records. Barbarella, he, he loved Barbarella, and he'd done a hand painted sleeve to the Barbarella album, the soundtrack. Um, yeah, I've, <laughs> I've still got most of them, I think. And I, I don't know whether to ask if he wants them back. He hasn't know? got a record player, there's no point. <laughs> he hasn't got a record player, yeah. you know, he'll probably say, no, I don't want them. You can have them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another Steve. question from here. Oh, hi. Yeah, Steve. Uh, John, uh, Space Mountain. Yeah. I'll never forget this. We, we're having breakfast, and, and you said um, about XTC, you went, um, if. <laughs> If they had a, a, a vinyl version of um, Dukes of Stratosphere in colour, it would be the, 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 the record company would own everything. But if they had it in vinyl and then had it back in colour, do you remember this conversation? Oh, no, that, I think you misunderstood that. What um, that was, was the... When they gave me a contract for um, doing the Dukes of Stratosphere, uh, they send you a contract. I mean, in the post, this before emails and stuff in the post. They send you a contract, and in the letter it says, if there's anything you disagree with, please let me know. And so I read through the contract. I don't have a lawyer or anything. I just do it myself, and usually I just sign it and don't even read it. And I'm reading through it, and Andy had just told me, he said, hey, guess what? They're going to release it in purple vinyl. You know, it's going to be in green and purple psychedelic vinyl. Isn't that great? And then when I get the contract, it says um, you get like 1% royalty. You know, not two or three or four. You get 1% royalty. And if it's pressed in coloured vinyl, you get half royalties. <laughs> so I crossed, I said, no, sorry, I crossed that clause out. And uh, it was, that was what it was. It was just basically Virgin, Virgin were totally, um, would you say, rip-off people. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like coloured vinyl, you get half royalties or no royalties because coloured vinyl is a promotional thing. You know, it's used for promotion. You know, and the other thing that happens with Virgin and other record companies is you get a certain percentage for doing, the, you know, one or two points miserable really i mean it doesn't amount to much unless you sell millions um and it when cds come out if it's a compilation you only get half royalties so when cds come out they would do the album and add extra tracks and then pay everyone half royalties because it's a compilation it's got extra tracks on 
And so everyone, the artists as well, would get half royalties and the record company would get the other half. So, so when Virgin kind of cottoned on to the fact that they could shove a couple of extra tracks on a CD, everyone, they could put the big express on with the three, you know, three extra yeah. tracks on, everyone suddenly gets, everyone gets half the royalties. Correct. Jeez, that's, yeah. that's outrageous. I know. <laughs> That's, that's I know. absolutely the average. So for things like Explode Together, you've only got yeah. half royalties because it's a collection. Because they consider, they consider uh, compilations as not being proper records. They're not proper albums. And yet Explode Together must yeah. have sold more than And you probably know the story, story with the Stone Roses is that when they signed their contract, CDs had just come out, and CDs were considered a bit weird and sort of promotional items. And 12-inch singles, well, that's just for clubs. That's a promotional thing. It's not the real record. So they never got any royalties for CDs or 12-inch singles. You only get records for 7-inch singles and the album, the vinyl just album. Just outrageous. <laughs> so absolutely yeah. outrageous. Steve, <laughs> you have got the question? Yes, uh, gentlemen here. Hi, John. All the studios you worked in, what was your favourite studio to mix and your favourite studio to record in? Your favourite studio to mix, your favourite studio to record in? I shall translate for the Liverpool. Uh, uh, such a, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> so favourite studios? Um, I don't know, really. I, it depends on what studio. Rockfield's great because you can live there. It's one of the few places where you can go residential. I mean, I'd... I like the residential thing because you're all under the same roof. You don't have to get the bus home and you don't get in late in the morning and you can, you know, go to bed when you want and get up when you want. So I like Rockfield and residentials. Although I do like Rack Studios in, in London. Uh, mixing, I don't know. I don't know now. Mixing's all different now with computers and stuff and plugins. So the main thing about mixing is the monitoring, really, is the speakers and what you're listening to. If you know... If you trust and know what you're listening to, then you should get a good result. And usually you find bad mixes are because of bad monitoring, not really hearing, you know? Another question, if it's okay? Hi, John. I just wanted to ask about um, your memories of working on Mark uh, Owen's Green Man album with Dave Gregory. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, God, good question. Um, yeah, Mark Owen. Mark Owen came about at the time that Take That, I mean, I'm, to be honest, I'm not a big Take That fan, of course, by any means, but Marco in, the, they'd split up and I, what could I say, I had a lot of pressure to do the record because, you know, it was, uh, it was going to sell, basically, and they wanted to do it quickly by October so they could release it at Christmas because next year was Robbie Williams was coming. And so they wanted to get Mark's record out of the way. And basically, we had free range. I did it with a guy called Craig Leon. And Craig is more of a songwriter than what I am. And so Craig helped Mark with the songs and the orchestrations, you know. And basically, we had free reign, infinite budget, really. We were in Abbey Road, in all three studios in Abbey Road. And we, yes, we had orchestras, we had the gospel choir, we had Clem Burke from Blondie and Dave Gregory from XTC. Uh, Clem Burke came over thinking he was joining XTC when he heard Dave Gregory. It's like, oh, I've got to do this gig because I'm going to be the drummer of XTC, you know. And then when he got in the studio, it's like, well, actually, it's, it's not XTC, <laughs> it's Mark Owen. <laughs> but no, we had, a good, we had good fun and... Um, I don't know, whatever you, whatever you think. We had good fun doing it. It was a good recording exercise, really. And pretty successful. I mean, whatever. Yeah, it was great. Mark's, Mark's great. It was lovely. Yeah. So <laughs> didn't Dave end up working with Blondie shortly after that? I think so, yeah. So, that, so they must have got on pretty well together, Clem yeah. and David. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. And um, Dave did string arrangements and things, yeah. I think, yeah. Uh, I was wondering about Bill Nelson. Do you have any stories about Bebop Deluxe at all that you remember? Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, how long have we got? It's Mike <laughs> in the room. Mike's a huge... Mike, um, one of our co-organisers, is a massive Bill Nelson and Red Noise and Bebop Deluxe fan. Uh, Michael, yeah, yeah. are you listening? Well, anyway, um, Bebop Deluxe, I don't know how many people know Bebop. I, I probably got the XTC job, first off, because of Bebop Deluxe, I think, because at that time... I was, I'd done two Bebop Deluxe albums and they were the greatest band in the world at that time. 
Um, and that's probably how I got the XTC things. I think I ended up doing about seven albums with Bill. And it was great. I mean, me and Bebop Deluxe, we spent the 70s together, really. Um, the second half of the 70s. You know, we went to the south of France. We did... I did about seven albums and, you know, and I saw Bill recently, um, went up to Yorkshire, and he's great. I don't know if anyone knows, you know, Bill's since he left, um, since he left Bebop Deluxe or they split up, he's made, God knows, 100, if not 200 albums himself um, in his room upstairs. And he's great. I mean, all the albums sound the same. He's got the same <laughs> sounds on them. You know, some are instrumental, some are songs. But, yeah, he's, uh, yeah he's, he deserves a lot more recognition than what he gets, but he does lock himself away, you know, and just stays up in Yorkshire, never comes, never, comes, never circulates, really. And never, never has guest musicians. You know, he loves, he loves people asking him to play. You know, David Sylvian and Harold Budd and those sort of people. And really, Bill should have played with other people and just expanded himself a bit more. But he just loves sitting at home making his own records. And they sell, you know. They sell. He can, he can make a 1,000 CDs, and within a month, they're all sold. Uh, so he's, he's doing good. Is there someone down there? Steve, the there, were two, there were two hands up down here. OK, I've got one here, one here. Lee. Hello. 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 I, I was just wondering if you've ever worked with an artist and you've maybe been asked to do something or you've sort of come across something you've you started doing and it reminds you of working with XTC. So, like, let's say, I don't know, maybe you've done something derby and it's like, oh, this is, like, Go Plus or, like, Takeaway or, you know, something unexpected like that happening. Sometimes, yeah, rarely, rarely, I'd say. I can't think of any example, but no, no one plays like XTC, really. I mean, those early records, you know, White Music, Go Plus, no one, no one really plays that music anymore. <laughs> I don't, that's, that's my thing. No, I've never really come across that. Yeah, yeah I'm uh, lucky enough to have seen XTC live several times, and for me, live, Terry was the driving force. I'm just interested to know what he was like in the studio. Still the same, the driving force, yeah. Uh, you know, he would... He would just, he's a drummer, he keeps it all together. You know, he sets the tempo and sets the pulse of the music. I mean, you know, no click tracks, no metronome or anything like that. It was always... Mm. No, there was never a click track. He was the click track, yeah, the human click track kind of thing. Yeah. No, he's, he's great. Um, but did Colin and Andy tell him how to play, or did he just get the song and play his own way? Uh, Andy would make suggestions. <laughs> I don't think Colin would really make suggestions, but Andy wouldn't discipline him. He wouldn't say, oh, you've got to do it like this. He would say, oh, that bit's good. Or why don't you try that on the floor, Tom, or something. You know, I mean, it was... a. Uh, uh, a shared thing, really. You know, I might say something. I might say, oh, that's too slow. Can't you play that bit faster or something? You know, that's what it's about, really. But, no, I mean, he takes direction. You know, if, if he'd say, no, I'm not going to do that, it's not going to work. You know, you might as well go home. You know, it's, it's like... So it's always a collaboration, you could say, in the studio, you know? Dubba, 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 chuh. Yeah, We've got time for one more. Any more, folks? Oh, there's a gentleman here. Hi. Um, I'm just interested in hearing you saying that you use cut-up tapes for all of the Love Explodes and the dub records. Um, they weren't the master tracks, were they? Because we all know as fans here, obviously, the, the really <laughs> difficulty in finding the master tracks of, uh, of the songs that haven't had the deluxe reissues. And uh, just a joke of question, but I just wondered if you have any insights on where these master tracks might be to give tips to Andy on, on how he can hunt them down? I, I've got no idea. Tell me, what, what have they lost? I don't know. Well, it, I know that, that, that there's no white music tapes, is that right? I don't know. There's, there are a couple of albums we're missing the master tapes for, and if people are around tomorrow, they might find out something very interesting about one of the missing albums, which has recently resurfaced. I'm not saying anything. But there are a couple of albums where the master tapes have gone and they've only got the two track stereos. So, that, yeah. I don't know. No. I'm, lo I'm looking forward to... You haven't got to any at home. 
No, <laughs> I'm looking forward to the White Music Stephen Wilson remix. Actually, I mean, good luck to him. White Music's <laughs> happening. White Music's happening uh, at some point. That's been working on for a while. Go to, I think, is still missing, isn't it? Or maybe it's turned up. There are a couple of the later albums which you were involved with, which. <laughs> They tried Abbey Road for go to. Well, weirdly, they turned, up, they turned up in the maddest. Mixed, uh, yeah, they've turned up in the maddest of places. Um, I don't know if everybody knows the story, but the the tapes for Skylarking turned up at Capital. Capital got nothing to do with XTC ever, but well, they, that's but, where they recorded it. But well, they, it's because they had the Todd Rundgren archive. Yeah. And Rundgren always said he never had the tapes, but he did. They were in the archive, his archive at Capital Records. It shouldn't be too difficult. You only got to go through the diary and say where yeah. were these. I mean, if you want go to, I'd, the first place I'd go is Abbey Road. Sure. Even though it was bloody 40 years ago, <laughs> you know, it's probably still there. <laughs> I'm just curious, what's your favourite XTC song? Oh, that's a great question. I know that was good. Go on. My favourite XTC song? Are you allowed a favourite? I'm going to say something really off the wall here. You'll probably agree or you go, oh, yeah, it is. Complicated game on drums and wires. <laughs> yes, <laughs> totally. I still, I still don't. Uh, you know, it still uh, makes me shiver. <laughs> and you know, maybe it's not a song, but I love complicated games and what Andy does and what Lily White did and everything. I think it's great. With XTC, do you think um, the drumming was so important? I I always felt the drumming was so important with music. It's not a loaded question, but I, I'm, I'm just asking questions sort of like, how do you produce a band where the drumming's so intensely intense? This is interesting. Uh, the, the, <laughs> that's, what, that's what drummers do. <laughs> I mean, drummers are meant to drum <laughs> and hold it all together. I mean... You know, I mean, bands are... You could say there's two things that make the, the sound of a band is the vocalist and the, and the drummer. The vocalist and the snare drum. Thank you. <laughs> OK, right. I think we're probably... If unless there's anything else, your last chance, your last chance, I think we should probably... Thank you so much, John, for being Thank here. You Thank you for coming. Thank you for... Thank you for your years of service. And thank you for... Thank you for, very personally, for producing some of... Or producing or tape engineering some of my favourite records of all time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Daryl Bullock and the legend, John Leckie! What do you call that noise? Thank you very much to Daryl Bullock and John Leckie for such a fantastic interview. And thank you once again to everyone who has supported the podcast on Patreon. And you can join them at patreon.com forward slash Mark Fisher. Thanks in particular to the following knights in Shining Karma. Terry Arnott, Kevin Burt, Lorenzo Chachi, Kale Corbett, Liam Duggan, Jamie Dunn, Jeff Farris, Leslie Gooch, Robert Graham, Alan Hughes, Marek Krauss, Jesper Kumberg, Robert Lawlaw, Dennis LeCourier, Liz Lynch, Murray Meikle, Yusef Murra, Karen Neal, Amy Parkinson, Mark Reed, James Reimer, Simon Slatome, Michael Sutcliffe, Mark Thomas, Nigel Waller and Martin Whitley. Great to have you all on board. I'll be back again next month with more convention fun and games. See you then.